I'm Mike DeLuca. Welcome to this rare In the Trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today I'm joined by John Hamburg, who co-wrote the screenplays for Meet the Parents, Meet the Fockers, and Zoolander. He also wrote and directed the films Safe Men and Along Came Polly. Thank you, John, for being here. My pleasure. It's good to see you. Apparently you've written some monologues. What was your favorite? Um, my favorite was when I was in college, I wrote one called Slacks. Slacks. Uh, slacks. As in pants. As in pants. <laughs> that was basically about a dad taking his 13-year-old son pant shopping at Brooks Brothers. And it was kind of inspired by me as a kid wanting to wear jeans or whatever, and my dad was a lawyer in New York, and all he ever wanted was for me to wear Brooks Brothers slacks. At 13? Well, I, yeah, I mean, my bar mitzvah suit was like a three-piece right. Brooks Brothers pinstripe suit. I looked like a banker. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was about that, and the, it's basically the dad telling his buddy at the office how his son, you know, didn't cooperate when they went slacks shopping. And where did you perform them? I, at different, like, black box kind of theaters around, uh, around the college. And where was, where was college? Brown University. So, yeah, I mean, that's where I feel like I started to learn how to write, really, because I'd write these monologues and rewrite them and, you know, really hone them. Well, you've written plays and you've written magazine articles. Did you pick up anything from that, kind of from those formats that you brought into your screenwriting um, skill set that kind of helped you? It was rewriting, you know, just like knowing that you write something and it's not done. You know, you got to keep going back and making it better and better and better. The revision process was aided by, by your previous experience? Yeah, the monologues and the plays. I mean, the, the magazine articles was just sort of a fun side thing, but plays and stuff. What did you write articles about? I wrote one when there was going to be a Writers Guild strike. Mm -hmm. uh, Isn't that every year? Every year, <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like, the idea was it was a wealthy screenwriting family, but with the story of Billy Elliot. So it was a family <laughs> of screenwriters and you know, what right. they would do when they went on strike. And oh, it was for great. Esquire. Do the different formats, or did the different formats ever inform each other? Did you bring any, anything to the screenwriting experience? Or did the, the play writing experience inform the articles? Like, what were they, or were they just different skill sets? I think it was, the plays got me writing monologues. And I think like in my first movie, Safe Men, and even mm -hmm. moments in Along Came Polly, I have monologues that you know, characters right. would, Safe Men particularly, you know, characters went on for three or four yeah. minutes. Safe Men's a monologues. wonderful film. It's a wonderful film that, that anyone who hasn't seen it should go see it. Cause, or, or, or rent it, because it's, it's kind of an unsung classic, and that got you to Along Came Polly, but it's a wonderful movie. Thank you very much. You're one of uh, 24 people <laughs> who have seen it. Uh, no, it's got, it, yeah. it came out, came and went, and now it's got a nice cult following, yes. and finally it's going to be on DVD. But uh, yeah, that was, that kind of started my whole career, basically. And uh, do you find now that the, the, the monologues continue when you write a script? Do you still kind of like find yourself writing long blocks of, of dialogue for, for actors to perform? Not, not as long. I mean, I think now, it's probably like now that I sort of know what I'm doing, right. I don't write three page monologues. But back when I started, you know, I didn't think about that. And I, sometimes those are the best things in the scripts, I think. And are they, do the actors receive those well? Because it's, I, I hear that actors love to sink their teeth into like <laughs> meaty blocks of dialogue. They, I think actors love monologues. You know, I mean, I certainly Paul Giamatti in Safe Men does a three-minute monologue, which yes. he does brilliantly, and I think he had a lot of fun doing it. You know, they don't get the chance to do that that much, especially in movies. So right. if you give them something, they they dig it. And is screenwriting easier for you than the articles and the monologues and the and the plays? Do you find that this is that it's a little more, you know, comes sec, uh, sec, first nature to you? That's the way I think. Like I always thought saw movies. Like I don't think I would want to be a novelist. Right. I just, the way I write is I picture the movie in my mind. So that, it, it's never easy, it's really hard, but it's like, that's what I gravitate to. Did you kind of grow up watching movies? Yeah. You know, I was the typical right. Star Wars, Close Encounters, and then The Jerk. Uh, that was like my seminal right. comedy experience. I mean, I literally think my parents had to take me out of the theater because I was laughing so hard. And did you know it was going to be comedy for you? Uh, when did you think you, you were going to, you could be funny and that was what you were going to, that was going to be your calling? It was always comedy. Like I thought growing up I'd be the editor of a comedy magazine. We, like my friends and I started the Dalton Lampoon at our high school. Mm -hmm. and that's what I thought. And then... The Upper East Side rarefied privileged high school Dalton? Listen, they were mean streets. <laughs> they were mean streets. The mean okay? streets of the Upper East Side. It was tough back then. <laughs> You don't know what it's like, man. Right. Um, but that's cool, you started the Dalton Lampoon. Yeah, we, we did that, and then I didn't know being a comic filmmaker was an option, and then my, it was the cliche kind of thing. My parents gave me a video camera junior year of high school, and I was like, 
oh my God, this is, combines my love of comedy with you know, growing up and being obsessed with movies. And then I just started making short films and that was it. And what was your entree kind of into the industry? Uh, let's see, I, made, I went to NYU film school and I made a Undergrad short, or graduate? Grad. Okay. Yeah, after Brown. The kind uh, where you can actually get a job after. You can kind of mm -hmm. get a job, yeah. So I, there I made a short film called Tick, which was like an eight minute movie about uh, two slacker bomb diffusers in a town where bombs go off all the time. <laughs> uh, and that was, it was kind of like, it was at a time where they were making all these really high concept movies and I was like, let's make a high concept movie and then forget about the concept. <laughs> and it's basically these guys just screwing around. So even then you had out. a talent for the, the situational comedy. Yeah, that was what I gravitated right. to. And then, so that got into Sundance and I got an agent from that. And then I wrote uh, Safe Men. And that basically, we, my agents read Safe Men and said, okay, well, this is great. We're gonna send it out. You're gonna be a millionaire tomorrow. And I was like 25, I didn't, I was like, I had no idea what was going on. I just was like, okay, go, do it. The next day they call up, everyone passed. So I was like, what, where's, right. where's the million? You're a hero for a day. Yeah, hero <laughs> for a day, everyone passed, but people liked the script, right. wanted to meet with me. But I, I was actually sort of relieved because I wanted to make it, I wanted to direct it myself as an independent film. And then we raised the money and we made that movie. So directing uh, was always something that you had in mind from even from the beginning of, of your career with the short and then obviously with Safe Men. Yeah, I, it, it's like I never really wanted to pursue a Hollywood screenwriting career. I mean, I ended up, it, it was basically Safe Men came out and I wrote and directed that and it just didn't do a lot of business, but people liked the writing in it, so I started to get hired as a writer. And then Ben Stiller had seen Safe Men at a film festival, okay. just randomly and loved it. And we started talking about working on stuff together. Mm -hmm. And that led to me starting work on Meet the Parents. And did you, do you find after Meet the Parents uh, did a lot of, I know the studio sometimes when a new writer hits town and, and their work was, your work is, was so wonderfully received, did you, did you get inundated with submissions for a script doctoring and, and, and then becoming the new Mr. Fix-It? Yeah, that, that stuff started. But actually, I did my work on Meet the Parents. Mm -hmm. And before the movie came out, the studio, Universal, was like, this was a great experience, you know, let's do something else, what do you want to do? And I knew I didn't want to keep, you know, fixing other people's movies. I said, I have, you know, I want to write and direct a movie. So basically we set up the movie that became Along Came Polly, and that was what, so I started working on that, and then Meet the Parents came out and became this, you know, big hit, which was great, because had it come out and failed, I think it would have been harder for me to go make my next movie. Right. What are the challenges of bringing a comic sensibility to a feature script? Are they different than bringing a sensibility to any other genre? I mean, I only do comedy, so right. I, it's just the way I see the world. Right. You know, so I don't really, to me, I, I look at a movie and just the way my brain starts to work, it goes through a comic okay. point of view. So you never think, how can I make this funny or what's funny about this? It's just automatically, if it's your idea, yeah. it's probably going to have humor. It's going to have a comic bent to it. I mean, I think it's... A lot of times my comedy, I think, has drama behind sure. it. Like Meet the Parents, I think a lot of what I tried to add to it was dramatic tension between Stiller and De Niro. You know, I, I always think that the characters in the scripts I write think that they're in a drama. Mm -hmm. Like they don't know that it's kind of funny what's happening, but sure. they take their lives really seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's, I always sort of use that as a guidepost. Now was it challenging to to be brought in to work on the sequel because the original is one of those great setups where the journey for the two characters uh, is you start out, they're on opposite sides, they have to grow to like each other and then it concludes with the appropriate, you know, I now respect you and yeah. there's mutual respect. But then in, for a sequel to something like that, it's like, it's like the odd couple in terms of a setup like that. You've got two guys, you ended with the two guys coming to an understanding. Right. Now you have to drive them apart again and bring them back together again for a whole new reason, was that difficult? It was really hard. I mean, that was definitely one of the hardest things I've ever worked on. Because yeah, you go, what, we don't want to just recreate the tension of the last one, so what can we do? It's gonna be boring if it's just De Niro hates Stiller, Stiller hates De Niro. But that's what I think, bringing those parents in and kind of defining what kind of characters they Ben's were. Ben's parents. Ben's parents, yeah. Added a whole other, you know, kind of tension to right. the story. Once we sort of figured out who right. they were 
and what their beliefs were and how that reflected on Greg and you know his marriage to Pam. That kind of helped the whole movie. Right, because you, you brought it to a new generation that had yeah. to come to grips with each other over the Yeah, course. exactly. But it was a tough movie to work on. I mean, it, was, it ended up being a lot of fun, but it was like, you know, because the first movie, it was De Niro versus Stiller. Now you're bringing in two powerhouses right in terms of Streisand and Dustin Hoffman. And you know, so suddenly scenes that in the first movie had two people now have four or five, you know, Blythe Danner's a major part of it and Terry Polo. So there was a lot, there's just a lot of plates in the air. Right. Now when you went to NYU grad school, you, uh, you went for two years but kind of declined to stay for the, for the yes. degree, degree. What, were you in a rush or what, what drove you out the door? <laughs> I, um, I loved it my first year, and that's when I made Tick. I made it my first year. It was an eight-minute, you know, color sync film. That's what you called it back then. Right. My undergraduate NYU films yeah. were out of sync. Okay. Which then, that's why I'm not a filmmaker. That's what, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, you got to get them in sync. Right. Graduate school, I'm sure they demand. Grad at least demand sync, sync it up. That's right. Okay. But, like, I did that, and then the second year, I started to feel like my entree into the business is going to be through writing. You know, I'm going to write a script that hopefully will be good enough that I'll get the chance to direct it. And if I'd stayed, it really would have been a four-year program. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I, you know, rather than stay for a total of four years, I'd rather write, you know, really learn the craft of writing feature scripts because that's what I'm going to be doing as a career if it all works out. So, you know, I just made a decision to leave. It was tough. I mean, it was because, you know, NYU Film School is a very sort of comforting place. You know, you have other filmmakers there and to leave and just be sitting in your apartment alone writing scripts was kind of right. a tough one. Did but, you have, did you have um, uh, contemporaries at school with you that, all, that also have gone on to, to have careers? Yeah, a bunch of guys in my, in my class have had really interesting careers. So, yeah, it's, it was a, you know, we still keep in touch. It was a good place to be. And what did you take away from the experience of, of making Tick that, that kind of served you well in, in your next chapter? You know, it's funny. It's like, I, I was sitting on the set of Along Came Polly, which is a much bigger budget movie than Tick was, obviously. <laughs> and I was like, it's ultimately it comes down to just sitting by the camera, watching the actors, and feeling like what you wrote is, you know, elevated and is working, and it's funny, and there's tension. It's like kind of not that different. So, Interesting. So you, the, you boil it down to the essentials, which are, in principle, at least the same. Yeah. I mean, you kind of ultimately forget about, you know, the trucks and right. the gym trailer for the star and all that stuff. And it's just about, you know, really what happens in this kind of small space. And I think on Tick, I started doing that. And, you know, Tick, things didn't work out. I wanted this huge bomb to be built uh, at the end. I mean, it was a major set piece. And at 4 a.m. the morning that we were shooting, I picked up the bomb that a friend of mine had made, and it was literally that big. Right. It was like, you know, the scene from Spinal Tap with Stonehenge. <laughs> but we kind of <laughs> improvised and, you know, made it work, and, and I think no one would know that it was supposed to be this huge bomb. And I think that's you know, the thing in all the movies that's like, you can't control everything, so you just try to make it work. So it taught you to think on the fly if you have to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like the last scene in Safe Men, you know, we had a very tight schedule, it just didn't work. There was a stunt involved, and it's like, the clock's ticking, and you go, what the hell am I gonna do? And I think that's why it's good to be the director and the writer, because then as the writer, you, 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 know, you kind of leave the directing, put your writer hat on, and try to figure out dramatically what would work. Did you begin the screenplay for Safe Men while you were still in school or, or after? I began it after. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I left and I was developing a feature version of Tick. Okay. And then the Oklahoma City bombing happened. And suddenly I was like, a film about right. you know, bomb diffusers just didn't feel funny to me right. anymore. But I think I took some of the dramatic storylines in that and put them into Safe Men. And then, so I wrote it the year that I dropped out. And based on your experience, would you recommend film school or any kind of schooling to aspiring writers or, or, or filmmakers? Do, do you find that it was a helpful um, way, to, way to kind of begin? Yeah, for me, it was very helpful. I mean, that first year to make that film and to be on other people's sets and be a cinematographer and assistant camera and do all that, was amazing. The writing program back then wasn't that strong. Mm -hmm. It didn't teach you, you know, how to write a feature script. I mean, it's so, it's so hard to teach. How yeah. do you know how to tell someone how to write a feature script? You just have to do it. You know, so I think if you're saying, I just want to be a screenwriter, 
I don't know whether film school is the best right. thing, but if you want to be a writer director, it's a good place to be. Now, what about those books about structure and you know the, either the McKee or the field? Do you find that there's anything to be gleaned from those? Textbooks? I read them all. Read them yeah, all. you know, I didn't realize. I, I it's funny. I thought I was like, oh, I didn't read those books. I don't need those books. And then I realized. I looked at my bookshelf and I have them all. You know, <laughs> I read McKee. I read Sid Field. I read The Writer's Journey. And I think you just absorb all that stuff. And even if you don't. It, I don't believe that, you know, plot point A has to be on page 27 and the midpoint pinch is on page 60 or right. whatever the hell that is. But I think to, it's just basically storytelling. It has to have a beginning, middle, and an end and, and rise in tension. And, you know, it's helpful if the hero mm -hmm. gets to his worst point somewhere towards the end. I mean, that's every right. story has that. Do you feel like you, you just kind of absorb that through osmosis from watching movies or did you... Do you have an internal barometer that will get you to those points regardless of the textbooks that you, you've, you have or that you've read? I think I just have something that, was, that went towards that direction okay. of dramatic structure. Because when I look at Tick, it was eight minutes long and I hadn't read all those books, but it's got, it's like, an, it's like a feature film compressed into eight minutes. And right, it's got to build. It's got to build, it's got a beginning, middle, and end, you know, first act, second act, third act. So I think there's just, probably from watching all these movies as a kid and you know just some innate sense of storytelling i think i had that you know i think like when i develop my screenplays i tell the story to friends out loud just as you know if we're sitting here mm -hmm. i tell you the story and i think just some people are great at writing and and not good at oral storytelling some people are pretty good at just telling stories i heard you were good at oral uh, yeah i am i am but uh, that's for another okay. episode Would you suggest that aspiring writers start with a short film? Yeah, I think it's a good training ground. You just learn, you make your mistakes, and you edit and you see what works and what doesn't work. I mean, there's such a difference between what you write and what you shoot and edit. It just, you know, you've got to learn how it's going to come out and maybe pacing and rhythm and all those things you can, right. you can glean doing a short film. Well, I imagine even if you're not set out for a career as a director, it will give you a crash course in dealing with actors or dealing with crew or just, you know, stuff that you should maybe know as a writer anyway in case you were called to the set or have to deal with actors and whatnot. Yeah, yeah I mean, screenwriting is interactive. You know, you're not, if you just want to sit in your office or your house, write scripts, that's, that's fine. But I think the beauty of being a screenwriter is like, you, you can be on a set, you can interact with the actors, you can listen to them and go, I know how to make this better, you know, for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why, in between writing and directing my own movies, I've really learned a lot writing on these other movies, other directors' movies, because you know you just listen to the actors. You know, you go, you sit in on rehearsals, and it just makes you better. Oh, so that's interesting. If you're not directing, you kind of use the other filmmakers as almost like a keeping your own skill set sharp for, and, and absorbing as much as you can, and then taking all that knowledge to your your own productions as a director. Yeah. So you enjoy being on the set when you're just the writer. I like it. I don't like it as much as when I'm the director, sure. but like, yeah, when I was working on Meet the Parents and just, you know, I was like a fly on the wall. You know, I was also interactive, you know, listening to the actors right. and, you know, hearing their story ideas or their character ideas and with the director, Jay Roach. But, you know, I definitely absorbed as much as I could. Right. And it was almost like another film school for me. Mm -hmm. What about PAing? Is there anything to be gleaned from that vantage point in the industry? It's great. I really recommend everybody do it. I, the year after college, I PA'd on my cousin, Doug Lyman, who's a director, sort of straight to video movie that we shot. We didn't shoot it, I was right. sleeping in the camera truck. <laughs> he shot it uh, in North Carolina. And I was a PA and it was the best because I just learned how a real movie set oh, okay. worked. You know, so by the time I got to my own set, I kind of knew, okay, well this is how a real movie works oh, with right. a first AD and, what movie, what, what movie did he get? Getting in. Getting in, okay. It's not a secret anymore. I think he used to say, you know, but it was, but, you know, it was his first thing. And, and, uh, and that was I, your first kind of view of, of a set and how things function? Yeah. And I, I was the PA and I was the stand-in for the lead actor. So it was, that was the best because right. I could sit there or stand there and just observe everything. Right. Most stand-ins, I think, you know, maybe they're mm -hmm. thinking about what they're going to have for lunch or something like right. that. But I was, I really wanted to be a director, so I was... Mm -hmm. You know, just looking at the lenses and the, 
how the production design worked and the set decorators, all that stuff. Did that give you an, uh, kind of a crash course in blocking in terms of the, being a stand-in and just seeing where they, where they put you and how they block the scene? Yeah, it was big because that blocking is like such a big thing, I yeah. think, and it's really nerve-wracking because that's, you know, you're just yeah. trying to figure out where the hell they're going to go and how you're going to shoot it. And yeah, I, I didn't know what blocking was before right. I PA'd on that movie. Do you do on-set rehearsals or do you rehearse for weeks before the shooting? I like to rehearse a little bit beforehand. I mean, in a perfect world, I'd rehearse as much as I could, but it just scheduling-wise doesn't work out that way. Right. So we do, like, over the two weeks before shooting, you know, we schedule rehearsals. And then on the day, I like to run the scene. You know, maybe you're stand, you stand off the set and run the scene and get the rhythms right. Because to me, it's like a lot about rhythm. Mm -hmm. The way I write, I hear a rhythm in my head, and then I, you know, you try to recreate that on, on the set. Do you outline before you commit uh, to writing a draft? Yeah, I do a lot of outlining. I mean, I think that's where a lot of it comes together. You know, it's like a, it's not a, it's not anything I would show to anybody. It's a meandering, crazy thing with bits of dialogue and story ideas and right. character notes. But yeah, I try to know where I'm going. And do, do the studios ask to see an outline before they see a draft, or how do you deal with requests to see treatments or beat sheets or, or outlines? I don't do that. I mean, I. Along came Polly, I pitched. I said, this is, I had made a deal to make a movie, and we were like, when we, when you come up with the movie and you tell it to us and we like it, we'll go. So I came up with this idea, went out and pitched it, and then just wrote a draft. Okay. So the pitch was built into the deal, in effect. Yeah, it was like, pitch us a story and let's, you know, with the assumption we're all gonna like it. Sure. And so that's what happened. You know, on the new thing I just did, I just wrote it as a spec script. So there was no. Okay. Allies, or I mean, no, you know, that I showed anybody. Do you ever solicit input from just friends and family before you, you come up with a script? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, uh, not so much family, but, uh, <laughs> friends. but friends. Yeah, I mean, there's a group of people I, you know, say, I'm thinking about writing this kind of movie, or like I said, I tell the story to people, you know, we'll go to lunch and I'll say, what, you know, this is what happens. And, and usually, like, when I'm developing it, you get to a point where something just doesn't work at all, and you can see the guy right. who you're telling the story to just go, you know, there's something that changes in their eyes. They right. disengage, and then you go, okay, that's where I gotta fix it. What was the genesis of the Meet the Parents project for you? you I know you were brought in after an initial screenplay had, had been written. How did, all, how did that all come about? It came about, basically, they had developed the movie for different actors. Jim Carrey was gonna do it at was one point. Was that a short at first? Yeah, I, mean, I never knew that. I didn't know that until till later also, but it began life as kind of a short film, right? It was an hour-long short film, okay. and I only learned that when the movie went into arbitration. And okay. suddenly I was like, oh, I see. And by arbitration, you mean arbitration by the Writers Guild? Yes. To determine screenplay credit? To determine okay. screenplay credit. So then it, it got put together with Jay Roach directing and Ben Stiller and Robert De Niro uh, as the stars. But originally it was, it was potentially a Jim Carrey vehicle? Jim Carrey vehicle, yeah. And he had worked with... Uh, Jim Hertzfeld, who I share screen credit with for a while on the movie. Um, anyway, so they started, you know, they had a start date and they were ready to go and they did a reading of it and I think felt like some things really worked and other things, you know, they right. didn't work as well as was they wanted it a, to. Was it a table reading with the, uh, the cast or before the, before the cast except for Ben and then it was people just kind of reading yeah, part? Yeah, it was Ben and De Niro. Okay. And basically it was like up on a stage, right. uh, you know, and I just watched it almost as an audience member. Right. Now that's where, that's where they just assemble actors to, to literally sit at a table and just read the script cold and see. Yeah, I know, think how De Niro loves doing that because I think it gives him a sense of, and, and Ben does too, of how is this thing, what kind of movie is it gonna be? Okay. So yeah, that's what they did. It, it, the movie was really going. I mean, I guess there was always a chance they could pull the plug, but the train had left the station. Yeah. And, um, and so they did this read through and I listened to it and had some thoughts about it and then met with the producer and the, and the director. Basically Ben Stiller said, there's this young writer, you know, he made this movie I loved and we had actually started talking about Zoolander at that point. Okay. And um, he said, go meet with him. So I met with them and gave them my ideas. And I remember walking out going, you know, I really would love to do this because I, I just felt a connection to it. And, maybe as a Jew who was going out with a wasp or a shiksa, you know, I could connect with that. Right. And just feeling awkward. I mean, most comedy writers are sort of awkward in the world. Right. Um, I could just relate to what Ben was going through and 
her parents and everything. So I gave them some ideas and then, you know, said, I hope this works out. And I got hired basically to write on it for two weeks with an optional third week. And how many weeks did it end up being? Eight months. <laughs> so, you know, it was the kind of thing where they, they said, you're the Ben Stiller guy to me. And I was like, I never worked that way before. I was like, but there's two people in a scene. Am I just supposed to write Ben's lines and not De Niro? You know, then you'll bring the De Niro guy in. Right. And that's how I think a lot of Hollywood movies work, where they're like, he's a specialist in right. this kind of thing. But Jay was like, just do as much, do everything. Oh, so that's interesting. Do you think that they, in, they had in mind, John will handle Ben's side, and then we'll yeah. bring in a, a person to handle other stuff? Like, in a, were they looking at it that, that segment? That's what I think. Mm -hmm. I think they were saying, John will make it funny for right. Ben, and he knows how to write for this guy. And, right. You know, what but I, mean, I and then we'll get Nick Pelleggi for De Niro's yeah, part. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, right. that would have been a weird kind yeah. of movie. Um, and, and you're saying Jay Roach, to his credit, just said, "Let's please God, let's have one writer take us the rest of the way." Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. he just said he didn't know if it would work at all, right. but he said at least he. Had, I think he had watched Safe Men okay. and read some of my writing and just mm -hmm. said, "Just do what you're gonna do," because I and I spent a lot of time with him pitching him a new outline for the story. I mean, a lot of the script was. Terrific, and there were funny set pieces, sure. but I had some new ideas. So he knew it wasn't crazy, you know, what I was going to do. I didn't just go off and do it. Um, and then I, I wrote the first act, basically. I rewrote the first act. Right. I was like, every three days, I'll give you another 30 pages. You know, now, 30, just, pages, uh, 30 pages to just Jay or 30 pages to the studio and Ben and Jay? Like, did you go uh, global? Just Jay. Just first, Jay. First, okay. just Jay. <laughs> and, um, and I remember sending it in. And then I didn't hear from him, and I walked around the block and go, okay, well, this, this was a good run. You know, I'm gonna get fired, <laughs> right. but I, they, I won't do that optional week, but you know, it was a great experience, and, uh, and it turned out he had left a message on my answering machine, but my machine was broken. It's not oh, in no. an office That's or like a romantic like comedy scene, where it's like yeah. waiting, waiting by the phone and the machine broke. That's right, mm -hmm. exactly. It was, um, it was tough, you know, and then I got the message and said, yeah, this is good, you know, let's keep going. Um, and from that point on, I felt much more right. relaxed and, and you know, could work on it. And what did you feel uh, was the main thing you brought to it? I think one of the big things was trying to heighten this sort of private war between Stiller and De Niro. And that manifests itself in a lot of the, you know, like the I'm watching you kind of stuff. And some of this was there. I'm not saying I, sure. the, you know, the movie was the movie. But I tried to bring a sense of these guys are engaged in something and the rest of the family doesn't know. And that, you know, and then it all culminates in that scene sort of at the end of the second act where they catch him spray painting the cat and Ben accuses De Niro of uh, a Thai, a secret mission to Thailand for some spy activity. So a lot of that, I think, was something I tried to bring. And then a tonal shift in terms of, yes, the movie still has broad comedy, but I think it, to me, it was very, it needed to be very relatable mm -hmm. and grounded in reality. And I think there's a lot of tension where you know you're really with Stiller's character. If the movie succeeds, you're with his character. Right. And you're going, God, it's so frustrating that Pam, his fiance, or his would be fiance, doesn't know what's going on with the dad. That the dad is literally over her shoulder being like, I'm watching you, right. to, you know, to, to Greg. Well, that really pays off when, when Greg finally gets his apology at the end, because you feel like he's earned it when De Niro yes. you know, just finally says, I'm sorry. Yeah. But part of that is the payoff for the reality base that you established through the whole movie. Yeah, I think the movie, you know, look, it could have been a great movie, super broad with different actors, but I think that part of the reason the movie works is because everybody can relate to what these characters go through. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has some familial relationship where you're meeting right. new people, you know, and, uh, and that you want to impress right. and that it doesn't always work out.